Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to Potter's House of Toronto. And today, we will hear the first of a two-part message that Jay has entitled, Home is Where the Heroes Are. And as you listen to the message, you'll hear him say that there's a difference between how we react to situations and how we respond to the opportunities that those situations create. And so I hope that by the end of the message, you'll understand the difference between the two. And so if you're ready, um, why don't we bow down our heads, let's pray to, to God, and together let's listen to God's word. Let's go ahead and do that. Lord Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sunday that you've given us. I'll thank you, Lord, for allowing us to join together in worshiping you, in studying your word. And Father, we pray, Lord, that you would open up our hearts and minds, Lord, that we can learn your truths and that you will transform us and allow these truths, Lord, to be applied in our lives. And so, Father, we just give you back all the glory, honor, and praise that you deserve, Lord. Would you speak to us? This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you all. We're glad you're here this morning. I, I, I hope you listen to those songs as we, uh, as we sang together to God in his presence, talking to him about the past and how the past gives us indications of the future, the way that he's been, he will always be. Uh, we, we, we sang with hope. Uh, we acknowledge that there's pain. Uh, at times, but we, we sang with hope in light of the fact that, that God's in work, at, at work in all of our hearts as we go. He, he is not committed to making us comfortable and happy and peaceful. That's not that, well, peaceful, yes, but comfortable and happy, not necessarily. We may go through some difficult times in anticipation of other times to come as he trains us, as he teaches us. And uh, the title for this week is right up there, Home is Where the Heroes Are. And uh, this is part one, just in case you're taking notes. I want to end the year uh, this year by starting with a story from God's Word, but I'll need to give you a little background first. The story comes from a rather unique Old Testament book, the book of Judges. What makes the book of Judges unique is the pattern that follows all the way through the book. It starts in the beginning and goes all the way through. And I say that because all through the book of Judges, it's clear that, that Israel had fallen into a pattern, a predictable habit. Yahweh God would work among them and, and they would notice it, they'd respond to him, and he would add his blessings to their lives as a, as a result. But then they'd forget that everything that they had in their lives that was good had come from God, and, and then they would turn away. And in response to that, because of forgetting, they'd turn away from the one true God, and they'd begin to worship false gods. God would then get their attention by allowing other nations to attack and overwhelm them, and there are several scenarios in the book of Judges. And then once the other nation was in charge, they would begin to oppress, obviously. That's what happens when you conquer someone. They would begin to oppress God's people, the people of Israel. And that's when the people of Israel would cry out to God and he would send a judge to deal with the invaders and Israel would then turn back to God. And then after they'd return to God, uh, Israel would push the reset button and off we go again. That was their habit. Judges 17, 6 pretty well sums it up when it says, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. One of the judges that God sent to call Israel back to himself and restore justice in the land was a man named Gideon. And his story can be found in chapter 6 and 7 of the book of Judges. And with that background, this is the story from God's word. Once again, the people of Israel disobeyed God, so God allowed the Midianites to swarm in and, and to attack and defeat them. Midian so oppressed the people of Israel that, that the people of Israel went into full retreat. They, they bit, built ramshackle shelters in, in clefts in the rock and in caves, and they lived there in hiding. People of Israel would plant their crops, but there was always someone from Midian who would come in and steal the harvest, the sheep, the goat, the cattle, goats, the cattle uh, were no safer e e either. The, and, and during the months that this went on, the people of Israel had little or nothing to eat, as you can imagine, and it wasn't getting any better. The people of Midian, the scripture says, were like locusts that swept across the land in their droves and, and consumed everything in sight. Then the people of God the people of Israel cried out to God, cried out to the Lord to help them. 
And when they cried out to God like that, God used the opportunity to bring them up to speed with what was happening and why it was happening. He usually did that by sending a prophet into their midst that would sometimes precede the judge. He would send a prophet to his people, the people of Israel, who spoke on God's behalf and explained everything. The prophet told the people of Israel that God wanted to remind them that he was the one who had brought them out of slavery and bondage in Egypt, and he set them free, and he gave them the promised land. He had done all these good things for them. He had given them the promised land as their very own country where they could live. The prophet then reminded them that after doing all that for the people of Israel, God had one rule, essentially. He had said to them, I am the Lord, your God, so don't worship any false gods instead of me. Don't worship any of the false gods that come from the land where you live. And uh, then God added, I told you not to worship those other gods, but you haven't listened to me. That's what he said through the prophet that day. It seems, I guess, that when Israel fell into that predictable pattern, God followed a fairly predictable pattern of his own. He allowed the people of Midian, the nation of Midian, to to sweep in and, and oppress the people of Israel. And it was clear that the mess that Israel was in at the time had happened because God allowed it, but it was also clear that the people of Israel were being held accountable because their disobedience had prompted God to allow Midian to attack. Then the people of Israel cried out to God, and it soon became clear that God was on the move once again to deliver Israel from the Midianites. All of this is in chapter 6. God sent his angel to a place called Ophrah, <laughs> not the TV show, though, but Ophrah, and told the angel to sit under the oak tree in some land that belonged to a man named Joash. <coughs> Excuse me. Joash had a son named Gideon, and Gideon was threshing wheat, a, a little bit of grain that, uh, that he had kept hidden or managed to keep hidden from the Midianites. And uh, he was hiding behind an old wine press as he threshed the grain. The angel spoke to Gideon. I love this part. The angel says to him, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. (laughs) Which probably seemed to Gideon to be an odd thing to say, considering that he wasn't fighting a battle at the time. He was actually hiding while he threshed some grain to make some bread. But in any event, Gideon picked up on the irony of the situation just like right away. He was quick on the uptake. He he turned to the angel and said, uh, uh, pardon me, sir, uh, but if the Lord is, is with us as you say he is, then, then why are things so horrible right now? Why is all this bad stuff happening to us? If God's with us, isn't he going to do something about this? Where, where are the miracles that he used to do? He rescued our ancestors from slavery in Egypt, and, and he's, but he's not doing anything about Midian. And, 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 so why would, you, why would you say to me what you've just said? Gideon seems to feel a little ticked right now. The Lord himself spoke to Gideon and said, get going, get up, get going, use the strength you have and save Israel from the armies of Midian. (laughs) Simple task. And then God added, right now I'm sending you to to get that done. Go. Pardon me, sir, Gideon said again, but how can I save Israel? My, My clan, the clan that I come from is the weakest of all the clans in Israel and I'm the youngest kid in my family. I mean, how can I be the one to go and save Israel? And and God spoke again and said, I will be with you and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Well, okay, Gideon said. But if you really are who you claim to be, I'm gonna need some identification. I I need you to prove to me that you are indeed my Lord before I just go running out here. So if you wouldn't mind, could you please just wait here and I'll go prepare an offering and I'll bring it back to you? And the Lord said, "I'll, I'll wait until you return. Gideon went inside and he prepared some goat meat and some broth and and some bread and he he brought it out to the angel and the angel told him to put it on top of that rock that's sitting right over there and Gideon did, Gideon did, Gideon did what he was told. The angel of the Lord then pointed his staff and touched the top of the rock where the bread and broth and and goat meat were sitting and, and as soon as he touched the rock, the entire rock exploded into flames, burst into flames, especially on the top and it burnt up the whole offering, the whole meal, just like an offering on an altar. Gideon was scared spitless. I've seen the angel of the Lord face to face, he wailed, and then he added, it's over for me, I'm gonna die now. The Lord said, take it easy, Gideon. Settle down, don't say that. You're not gonna die. 
And having said that, the angel that had appeared through whom the Lord was speaking just disappeared. When the angel was God, gone, Gideon built an altar there in that place and, and named it the Lord is Peace. And later that night, God spoke to Gideon again. God told him what to do. You see, Gideon's family had become idol worshipers in the midst of the mess. In fact, they had an altar that was dedicated to a false god named Baal and a totem pole of sorts that they had dedicated to an even more important goddess called Asherah, who was the mother of Baal. Gideon's family was worshiping false gods, so before asking Gideon to do anything else, the true God asked Gideon to destroy the altars that they had made to the false gods and, and to take down that Asherah pole. God told Gideon that when he was finished with that, he was to build an altar to the one true God. And then get his father's second bull, for whatever reason, his second bull, and offer it as a burnt offering there on that altar. Gideon took 10 of his servants and, and did what the Lord had told him to do. Now, you can imagine that Gideon was, was probably afraid of how his dad and mom and the rest of the family would react, not to mention the other people in the town who were using these, these uh, dedicated sites to the false gods. So Gideon chose to do all that he did there with his ten servants in the middle of the night under the cover of darkness. The next morning when the people of the town woke up, they saw that Baal's altar had been broken down, that the, that the Asherah pole had been demolished and, and cut down, and, and an altar to Yahweh was standing in their place, and a bull had been sacrificed on top of that altar to Yahweh instead of to Baal or to Asherah. To say that the town was peeved was an understatement. They began to investigate, to look into what had happened, and uh, I'm not sure how they, how they figured it out, except for maybe the 10 guys that, that, that Gideon took with him to get this done, but, uh, but they discovered that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. So they went to Joash's house, and they demanded that he bring out his son, Gideon. Bring him out, and, and because we, we're going to put him to death. We're going to execute him because of what he did to Baal's altar and to the, to the Asherah pole. And uh, Joash stood up for his son. I'm not sure that he actually believed what he said, what he's about to say, but he stood up for his son by asking the people of the town if they really needed, if they really thought that Baal needed their help. If they really thought that Baal needed, Baal, or however you say that, needed to be defended by them. He reasoned with them that if Baal was truly a god, he can take care of himself, right? Can't gods, like, take care of themselves? And so the people, they listened to that, they responded to that by giving Gideon a new name. From that day on, they called him Jerob Baal, which means uh, that, that Baal is going to take this dude down. That's, really, that's a rough nickname to have. But anyway, that's the story from God's word. I can, I can hear you now. That's not the story of Gideon, right? I don't know how many of you were thinking that because you were ready for this, right? You, that's not the story of Gideon because the story of Gideon has a, a fleece in it that gets wet or it stays dry. The story of Gideon has God saying that Gideon has too many soldiers and then asked Gideon to use 300 men to take down 120,000 Midianites. The story of Gideon has pitchers and torches and swords and the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Yeah. I can hear you telling me to get my act together and tell the real story of Gideon. And I don't blame you for feeling that way because the story of Gideon is a great story. And I have to admit that I love telling that part of the story, uh, that where, where Gideon miraculously wins a battle against insurmountable odds. I think it's awesome. But I wanted us to understand this morning that there's a backstory to the story of Gideon. I wanted us to see that there were some things that God wanted Gideon to do at home before Gideon went out and did the other stuff out there. You know, the stuff that would have him leading Israel to that surprising victory. And I promise you that if God allows, I'll tell you the rest of the story next week, but only if you let me focus on this part of the story this week. I, 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 that sounds really stubborn on my part, but deal with it. Uh, because there are things in this part of the story, there are things in this part of the story that I, I don't want us to miss. 
I've been fairly intimidated this past week trying to put this message together because you know that we have a tradition here at the Potter's House uh, to end the year on, a, on the last Sunday of the year with a message that looks back on the year that has just passed and to begin the year next Sunday on the first Sunday of the year to begin the year with a message that looks ahead to things that are to come, the year to come, which sounds simple enough until you remember that this year has been 2020, a year that will live in infamy to, you know, murder a quote by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 2020 has been the year of COVID and quarantine and social distancing and face masks and unemployment and Zoom meetings and online classes and vaccines and an election that just wouldn't end. We've all had to face things this year. We've all had to face things that happened in, in Missouri that didn't happen in other places. We've had to face things that happened in our community here at the lake that didn't happen in other communities. We've had to face things that happened in our church that didn't happen in other churches. And the starkest truth of all is we've all had to face things that happened in our families that didn't happen to other families. 2020 has been quite a year. In other words, we've had a lot to react to in 2020. In fact, we've had a lot more to react to in 2020 than we usually have to react to in a typical year or, I don't know, maybe a normal year. But as we think about how we've reacted to the events of 2020, I want to remind us that there's a difference between reacting and responding. There's a difference between reacting and responding. And more specifically, there's a difference between reacting to a situation and responding to the opportunity that situation creates. Reactions are knee-jerk, and, and we don't always react to situations in quite the way we'd like to because a reaction is more or less immediate, like the way your knee jerks when the doctor hits it with one of those little rubber tomahawks. I always think the doctor's playing with, with me when he does that, but sometimes you can't control the way you react quite as well as you'd like, but you always have something to say about the way you respond. Because how you respond is something that you have time to think about after you react. Are you tracking with me? We all had a knee-jerk reaction to COVID and quarantine and social distancing and face masks and unemployment and Zoom meetings and online classes and vaccines and an election that just wouldn't end. But after we reacted, we had a lot of time to think about how we reacted to all those situations. And we had a lot of time to think about how to respond to the opportunities those situations created. And I want to say this next part very carefully, but I'm afraid that many of us made no difference between the way we reacted to the situations we faced and the way we responded to the opportunities those situations created. I'm afraid that all year long, many of us carried our initial knee-jerk reactions to situations. And because of that, we missed out on our chance to respond to those situations in a godly way, to respond to those opportunities in a godly way. And that doesn't mean that we're all bad people, but I'm afraid it does mean that 2020 was a year when we may well have lost sight of the main thing. We thought that COVID and quarantine and social distancing and face masks and unemployment and Zoom meetings and online classes and vaccines and an election that just wouldn't end were the main things this year, but they weren't. We forgot that whether it's 2019, 2020, or 2021, 21, the main thing for our church never changes. And the main thing is right there in our purpose statement. The Potter's House exists to be the church. By making Christ committed followers who will make Christ committed followers in our community and around the world through relevantly teaching and living the pure word of God. That's the main thing. We exist to be the church by making disciples. The interesting thing about making disciples is that most of our disciple making does not happen within the walls of this building. And the simple truth of the matter is that we do more disciple making at home than we do anywhere else. And if that's true, then we do most of our, if it's true that we do most of our disciple making at home, then it's equally true that the primary people we disciple are the members of our family. And if that's true, then dad and mom, it's equally true that it's from you that your children learn how to react to situations. And if that's true, then 
it's equally true, dad and mom, that it's from you that your children learn how to respond to the opportunities those situations create. And there it is. I just stopped preaching and started meddling in your lives. And I would ask you for forgiveness, but I'm too proud for I don't know. It's possible, I suppose, that, uh, that uh, you, some of you don't think that I'm meddling in your life because you don't have kids growing up in your home. I, I saw the look of relief on, on some of your faces. I'm not going to point you out right now. But before you take refuge there, let me just say, let me say this as clearly as I can, that if no one is following your lead, if no one is watching how you live, if no one is learning about Christ from you, and there's an even, there are even more serious questions you need to be asking yourself than the ones that I'm asking this morning. So I want to assure you that I'm meddling in my own life as well. As I look back on the way I reacted and the way I responded to the mess of 2020. All that to say that 2020 has been quite a year. And I thought that the best way to gain some perspective on this past year would be to consider the really difficult year that Israel faced while the Midianites ruled their country back well, somewhere around 1150 B.C. They might be amused at what we called a bad year after the year that they were having way back then. And I hope you caught the truth in context. Gideon reacted to the situation when the angel came to talk to him. Pardon me, sir, he keeps saying. This doesn't make no sense. So he reacted to the situation, and he responded to the opportunities the situation created. And God intended to use Gideon to deliver the people of Israel from the really, really bad year that they were having. But before God mobilized, before God suddenly sent Gideon into, that, into the fray there, before God mobilized Gideon and sent him to work out there, he sent Gideon home to sort out some things with his family. So I thought it would be worthwhile to take some time this week to, to look at what we may need to do at home before we talk next week about the things that God might have us doing out there. And that all comes from the first part of Gideon's story. And that first part is not often talked about. In fact, I don't think I've ever heard a message on the first part of Gideon's story. We always focus on that last part. The first part was something that happened before the battle with Midian before the 300 men and the torches and the jars and the trumpets and, and before the amazing victory of 300 over 120,000 because before God sent Gideon into battle, he sent him home. Something wasn't right at home and in God's mind that took precedence over what wasn't right in the nation. You see, Gideon's father and family and, and maybe even Gideon himself paid homage to Baal and Asherah and God sent Gideon home to put a stop to that. But but why is that so important? Because one thing that's clear in God's word is that the poor decisions I make and my, as my children are watching me are very likely to become the poor decisions they make, my children make, while their children watch them. And that means that God is able to anticipate that if a particular thing is true of the father, it would be true of the son. We even have English idioms that say the same thing. Like father, like son. The acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. We know what that means. He's a chip off the old block, we say. We never mean kind things when we say that, but that's what we say. And, and before you think that we're picking on dads too much, I, I bet mom, you have to be careful about excusing yourself from this pattern as well. Remember that in the case of mothers, oh, forgive me for this, you can throw something at me, but hold it till later. Uh, in the case of mothers, God speaks directly when the scripture says, as it is with the mother, so it will be with the daughter. The two things go together. A while back, I, I heard a story that illustrates this truth. There were guests over for dinner, and after a hard day of cooking, mom asked her daughter to, to say grace over the meal, at the beginning of the meal. The daughter, you know, kind of withdrew in embarrassment and, and said that she didn't know what to say when she was saying grace, whatever really that was. So mom said, just say whatever you've heard me say when I pray. So the child bowed her head and prayed, dear Lord, why on earth did I invite all these stupid people over to dinner? Amen. 
I don't know if it's a true story. But in some ways, in, in some odd way, we're talking about the science of genetics. Now, you may have noticed, I think, that I have brown eyes, and if you stand, spend any time talking to Faith, you know that she has beautiful blue eyes. Uh, but to figure this next bit out, you need to know that my father, my father also had blue eyes, and that means that Faith and I, get ready for this, had a 50-50 chance of having blue-eyed children. We had three brown-eyed children, but we had a 50-50 chance of having blue-eyed children. And, and you can see that on this old chart from high school. You remember making one of these in science class? And how many remember making one of these in science class? The same people, three people that remember everything else. But um, I remember making that in science class before I knew that my wife was going to have blue eyes. My eyes are brown uh, because I carry the dominant brown eyes gene. That's the, 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 big, the big B there. But I also carry the recessive blue eyes gene because my father's eyes were blue. The face eyes are blue, so she only carries the two recessive blue eyes. And because the recessive genes actually outnumber the dominant genes, we had a, well, you can see it there on the chart, uh, the, the kids on the left there are going to be uh, brown-eyed, and the kids in the... Anyway, we had a 50-50 chance of having blue-eyed kids, and, well, it, it did skip a generation. Steve and Jen have the same thing going on, and uh, they actually have two blue-eyed kids and one brown-eyed girl. So eye color may be something that, that's up for grabs when it comes to genetics, but it, it really is something that we inherit from the parents. But a 50-50 chance of our having brown, blue-eyed children wasn't the statistic that frightened me. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, I read in Time Magazine that one out of every four children born in the world would be Chinese. Now, my, my kids, are, are we only have three kids, and that's why we only have three kids. That one out of four statistic scared me. I, I didn't want to take the chance of having a child grow up in our home that I, I couldn't talk to because I don't speak Mandarin. And I shared that silly statistic I did in a, when, when I was one of the speakers at a, a Korean a missions conference at a Korean church in New York City a few years back, because Koreans love to have stuff like that said about the Chinese. And then I went on to tell the story about the Bukalot leaving their, their head hunting behind and, and sending out missionaries. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've always thought of that as one of the great redemption stories of the 20th century. And, and so I'm always happy to tell that story. One of the other speakers at that same conference was a man named Eli Chikuna. He's a, a tribal guy from, from South America. And he spoke the following morning. He got up in a very somber voice and he, he began by saying how deeply moved he was by the things that I had said the night before. And then he added that, in, in fact, I, I couldn't sleep all night after Jay spoke because, well, I have four children and I was awake all night wondering which one of them is Chinese. That was, he's joking, of course. Uh, you, you'd have to understand tribal people, but he's joking. But we do have to say that a child's heart is deeper than genetics and that as your child grows, he or she will inherit far more than eye color from you. In fact, your child will someday be the product of what you've taught him or her by means of your daily example. Your children are learning habits and attitudes that are shaping their lives. Your children are learning how to react to situations and respond to the, uh, the opportunities created by those situations as they watch you react and respond. Your children are shaping their ideas about who they are and their place in this world, not only by the things that you say to them, but by the way you interact with them and the example that you set for them. In other words, you're making disciples right there in your home. Your children have watched as you've reacted, reacted to COVID and quarantine and social distancing and face masks and unemployment and Zoom meetings and, and online classes and vaccines and an election that just wouldn't end. Your children have been watching the way you've responded to the opportunities that have been created by, well, I'm not going to do the list again. They've watched your reactions and your responses, and they have learned life lessons from what they've seen. And there are other people besides your children in your life who have watched you, who respect you, who have learned from you this past year. And I'm wondering whether the things that others have learned from us as we've re reacted and responded this year, 
will sustain them as they face difficult and confusing times in the future, whether it's our children or anyone else who may be following our lead. As they've learned the things that they've learned from us. We have to come to, to terms with the fact that others are watching us, that others are learning from us. We have to come to terms with the fact that, that, that the, the people who are closest to us and trust us the most will naturally learn to react and respond in the same way we react and respond. And when it comes to this, it doesn't matter whether you're someone's parent or child. It doesn't matter whether you're someone's brother or sister. It doesn't matter whether you're someone's grandpa or grandma or grandchild. We all need to learn to live lives that reflect God to the people who are closest to us, the people who know us best, because home is where the heroes are. I discovered some sobering statistics about two men who lived in the early 1700s. The early 1700s, Max Jukes was one of them, and he was an atheist, and by all accounts, an ungodly man. The things that people say about poor Max Jukes, he was an ungodly man. Jonathan Edwards, boy, those letters are small. I hope you can see, if you can't see them, feel free to strain your eyes. Jonathan Edwards was the other one, and, and he was a, a pastor, and by all accounts, a, a true man of God. A careful study was done of, the, of their descendants, and that study, and I'll help you to read if you can't see it, that study uncovered that Max Jukes had 540 known descendants. 310 died in abject poverty, 100 were drunkards, 300 of his female descendants were prostitutes, 150 were convicted criminals, and seven were murderers. The study also uncovered that Jonathan Edwards had 1,394 known descendants. 295 were college graduates, 13 were university professors, uh, presidents, 65 were college professors, 80 of his descendants were public officials, 60 were physicians, 75 were military officers, 100 were attorneys, 30 were judges, 60 were prominent authors, three were United States senators, one became vice president of the United States, and 100 became preachers and missionaries. Does it make a difference how we live? You bet it does. You bet it does. Because we make disciples, listen to me, we make disciples whether we mean to or not. People follow our lead even when I think I'm not leading. Your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren for generations to come will likely do life more or less the way you've done life. They'll likely react the way you've reacted to situations. They'll likely respond the way you've responded to the opportunities those situations create. So maybe as 2020 comes to an end, maybe it's time to rethink the way we reacted and responded. And maybe as 2021 becomes a reality, it's time to trust God for better reactions and better responses, not only for our own sakes, but for the sake of those who are watching us, for the sake of those who are following our lead, for the sake of those who are learning from us. 2020 has brought us more stressful situations to react to than of many of the years that preceded it, and maybe many of the years that preceded it all combined. But please know that 2020 has also brought us greater opportunities to respond to than, than the years that preceded. Remember God told Gideon to get rid of the old altar and the false gods, but then God told him not to stop there? Did you, did you catch that in the story? God added that after Gideon got rid of the old altar to the false god, he was to build an, a, a new altar to the true God. And this cusp between 20 and 21 is a chance for us to do the same. <laughs> I almost said out of the frying pan into the fire, but I'll leave that as it... Uh, we can believe God. We can believe God to lead us to get rid of the old, ungodly reactions and responses to the mess around us, even as we replace those old, ungodly reactions and responses with truly godly reactions and responses. And in terms of how we might respond differently in 2021... I want you to know this morning, if you haven't figured it out already, people in the world around us are looking for something more intensely than they ever have. People in the world around us are looking for something. 
They're like the man who pauses the movie that he's watching and goes into the kitchen and opens the refrigerator door and just stands there and stares at the food that's there in the cold. Does this remind you of anybody? <laughs> he knows he wants something, right? He's watching the movie. He knows he wants something. He's just not sure what. He grabs this and he looks at it from top and bottom and from all angles. And then he puts it back because he doesn't know what he wants. He just knows that it's not this. So he stands there for a moment and finally picks up that, uh, but he does the same thing with that as he did with this because he still doesn't know what he wants, uh, but he does know that he doesn't want this or that. Finally, he settles on that over there in the back of the fridge. It's always the stuff in the back of the fridge that are, I don't know, have, they've started a life of their own back there. They've got their own little party going on. But he, that other thing in the back of the refrigerator, because he knows somehow, magically, mystically, suddenly at this moment, that's the thing he wants. He finds a spoon or fork and digs in with enthusiasm and then as soon as he finishes eating that, he realizes that that other thing, uh, uh, well, that, that wasn't it after all. And so as his movie remains on pause, he begins another search for this or that. Does that sound familiar? Now don't hear what I'm not saying. Now, you know, Jay says we shouldn't eat snacks when we're watching a movie. Right? No, I'm not saying you shouldn't eat a snack. You just go right ahead when you're watching a movie. But what I am saying is the world is like that man standing in front of the refrigerator. The world of 2020 is like that man standing in front of the refrigerator. But we all needed a time like that. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were, I don't know, maybe you watch in your jammies and it wouldn't be appropriate, but wouldn't it be wonderful if Bobby Flay or somebody just kind of appeared there in the kitchen at, at, midway through the movie and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook something for you. You, you know, just, just go sit down, pick up your movie, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook some. We all need somebody like that to step up to the stove and say, hold on a minute, I'll cook something that'll be unlike anything you've ever eaten before. Not secondhand, but unlike anything you've ever eaten before. It'll start by taking your breath away and, and then it will satisfy your hunger so thoroughly that you'll never stand before an open refrigerator again. We all need that. There hasn't been a time in the last 100 years that the world has needed that more than they need it right now. Because listen to me, through the mess of 2020, God has paused the movie that the world was watching. And the people of the world right now are more intent than they have ever been to find something that will satisfy the hunger in their hearts. If you know Jesus today, you can step up to the stove and cook up something for them that will satisfy their hunger for all eternity. So let's stop forcing people to eat the dirt and sticks that we find on the ground or have found on the ground around us and let's step up to the stove and serve them the good news that will satisfy them forever. And while we're at it, maybe we can take a few mouthfuls ourselves as well to take away the bad taste that's left in our mouths from the things that we've been eating during 2020 now, these past few months. The Potter's House exists to be the church. By making Christ committed followers who will make Christ committed followers in our community and around the world. By relevantly teaching and living the pure word of God. Will you stand with me in the presence? Our Father and our God, we thank you today for the goodness that you show us every single day. God, we've reacted this year. We all have. And as I look back on my year and, and the way I reacted, I, I have to tell you, God, that I, I, I could have been more in tune with you as the moment unfolded. I could, have, I could have been asking you to keep me in the moment and to see you through the mess. And God, that's my prayer. As I, as I venture into 2021, I, I want to be better at that. And I... I trust that these good folks do as well. And by way of response, God, we, we had lots of time to sit and think. We had lots of time to be involved with our families. We had lots of time to, to decide how we're going to respond in a godly way. And, and in, in some cases, God, I, I just never got to that godly response. I, I held on to the anger. I held on to the anxiety. Or I held on to the fuming or... God, I pray that you'd help 
me to set a different course for 2021. God, we realize that those things are all under the blood. We realize that those things have all been forgiven as we've, as we've trusted Jesus as our Savior. He's paid the penalty for all of that. And, and God, as you've told us in your word, your mercies are new every morning. And so we're gonna get up tomorrow morning with an anticipation of you offering us a fresh start, no matter how dark and difficult today was. We wanna head in that direction for your glory. We wanna make disciples, God. We want to be aware that people are watching us. So send us out there, we pray, to do that. God, if there's people that we need to talk to and apologize for reactions or responses, then give us the courage that we need to, for that as well as we launch into 2021. Thank you so much, Father, for your work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God for the, the word of God through Pastor Jay. Now, uh, I just want to to impart to you our mission as a church. The Potter's House of Toronto really exists, first of all, to honor God by making authentic followers of Christ, starting with our family, to our community, and around the world, through relevantly teaching and living the pure word of God and serving one another with the gifts that God has given us. My prayer is that that would be um, a reminder for us as we face 2021, that we can truly fulfill the mission that God has given us. Now, I just want to also share with you our vision. So that's our mission that defines who we are. Now, what we want to achieve, this is a snapshot of what God wants us to fulfill. And that is to see a multitude of authentic followers of Christ who lives to be the church to be the church in making disciples in their families, communities, and all throughout the nations. Again, all for the glory of God. Now, you can know us more by checking our website. You will see our um, website uh, link there, as well as our Facebook and our YouTube, so you can follow through the teachings that we have. Thank you, and may God bless you all.